good good morning and welcome to Grain Concerns uh, August the 14th. Um, we will be starting the webinar right away. If you have any questions uh, during the presentations, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu and we will try to make sure they get answered at the end of each presentation. So uh, Lionel, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to Growing Concerns for August 14th. Uh, we're going to be covering a few things uh, today and uh, got a little bit uh, later a start because we were just trying to make sure everybody was on here. So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, you see the agenda in front of you, we've got a few things planned and we're going to jump around a little bit. Uh, we're going to start off first uh, with uh, Dennis Lang from uh, Maffrey. He's going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, assessing and staging uh, the, uh, the soybean crop that's out there right now. Um, it's uh, getting uh, quite a few phone calls as to, you know, how much longer do my soybeans need, uh, you know, what stage are they in, and I thought it would be great if we could get Dennis to uh, uh, go through a presentation regarding that. Uh, Dennis has got uh, years of experience with soybeans, so uh, uh, Linda, if you want Dennis uh, to key up Dennis, we'll get started. Well, good morning, all. We're going to see if we have our screen here. Can we uh, let me get rid of some of these uh, other options on here? Uh, here we go. Hey, Linda. Yes, go ahead. Um, to minimize my to minimize this window uh, that's showing up uh, on the screen. Right okay, now. we can't see it, but there's a button. There's a little tab that sticks out on the left hand side, and right at the very top, there's a white arrow surrounded by orange. Gotcha. Just so click it. Okay. okay cool. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, today I'd like to talk to you about uh, soybean maturity. We're, we're getting a lot of questions on that and where things are at. Um, I'm going to start off here. This is so, not something you want to be seeing at any time of the year. And, uh, this is why I think some, some uh, of us are a little concerned, I guess, or there has been some concern. But uh, let's go through some of these and let's see what, uh, see what we have to say about that today. And I'm not advancing. Why am I not advancing? Bottom left-hand corner. There you go. There you go. Okay. So what do we know about soybeans in 2013? Um, well, let's start off with uh, most of the soybeans were planted in, uh, in that mid-May to uh, early June time period this year. Uh, we got a bit later start than what we normally would have. Uh, but uh, generally things went in in pretty good shape. Uh, we also know that we did uh, hit a bit of a record here this year. We had uh, a million acres of soybeans this year. And um, part, that's partly due to MASC expanding their crop insurance uh, coverage this year. And uh, this next slide here will show you what type of expansion that we do see. Uh, the green area here is the, uh, sure, is the new uh, insurance test area. And that insurance test area is also for corn, edible beans, sunflowers, and lentils in this area. Um, so uh, it allows growers to have some coverage and uh, right now we have uh, well, I guess four different zones uh, for soybean production and uh, each zone will have their uh, their varieties that will work best for them in those areas but uh, that's one of the big things that we've uh, big, big changes for this year. Um, what else do we know about the soybeans this year? Uh, we know that uh, beans that were planted around that May 15th took a bit longer to emerge this year mainly because around that time period it was a little cooler, so we were seeing some beans in the ground for two and a half to three weeks, whereas some of the beans that were planted a little bit later, right around May 25th, uh, basically took about two weeks to come out of the ground. Um, something else that we know, and we ta I've talked about this at many different presentations over the uh, uh, past year, and I'd like to kind of reemphasize this again as well, um, because these are the kind of reasons why we, we stress the maturity so much. Um, Maturity is always the key to growing a successful crop of soybeans. Um, you want to grow a variety that's suited for your growing region, and that's, uh, to me, one of the more important things with soybean production. Uh, the next couple of slides here uh, will uh, show you um, some of the differences in the, in the varieties and how they mature. This first slide is uh, of the uh, core sites in Manitoba, the core soybean sites, which are located in four locations this year. They're in Portage, Morris, uh, Carmen, 
and San Adolf. And at these core sites, uh, we test all the soybean varieties, whether they're long season, mid season, or short season varieties. And as you can see here, uh, on the left hand side are your shorter season varieties. And as you go from left to right across your screen, you'll notice that the uh, yields will, not, will increase. And that's typically when you have a good long season, that's what you'll see is that the longer season ones have more yield potential. Uh, they also put you a bit more at greater risk as well, the longer season ones, if you put all your eggs in one basket and only grow long season varieties. So if you're growing beans in the Carmen or Morris area, you want to be, and you're growing a few thousand acres, you want to spread your risk out a little bit. Uh, you want to be growing some of the beans down in, uh, you know, in this range here, uh, in the mid-range and also the longer season range. Uh, also, too, to note that these red diamonds that you see here are Czech varieties. NSC Porters was a Czech that we used last year. Uh, going into this year, we're using a new Czech. We're using 004R21. It's a legend seed variety, so it'll be a, a new Czech for Seed Manitoba this year. So any varieties that are in the top left quadrant here uh, are going to be earlier but higher yielding than Portage. Any of the varieties that are in this quadrant on the right-hand side are going to be longer season but higher yielding. So again, you can kind of pick and choose based on the maturity and uh, to give you the greatest success. But what happens though if you look at some of the early sites that we test in Manitoba? Uh, the early sites that we test would be in Arbor, Stonewall, and this year we've also included Bojager. Well, this is the data from last year's trials, and these are based on two site locations last year. They were uh, based on Arbor and uh, Stonewall. And what you'll see here is uh, one thing to stress as well, in the short season ones, we only t test the early to mid-range varieties. We don't really test the real long season varieties, and this is partly the reason why. And if you look on the left-hand side, our early varieties are our highest yielding, where as the maturity gets longer, because they don't have the, the quite the same season as what they do down in the valley, you'll see the yields tend to decrease. So it's very important to pick a variety that's going to be very suited for your growing region. And this is the reason why. Um, had this slide up here before, and I'll, this is a slide from uh, 2004, August 19, uh, where we had a frost that went down to minus 7 that morning. And uh, just for interest sake, our provincial average um, that year was actually 8 bushels an acre. We were growing a lot more conventional soybean varieties than what we are now. Um, now we're growing 95% round up ready and 5% uh, conventional. Uh, back in 2004, this, the blend was more like 60% conventional and 40% Roundup Ready. Um, now the varieties that we're growing are a little earlier. And uh, in 2004, the other thing to note is that uh, a number of the soybeans went in in June. Um, and uh, that particular year, crop insurance did actually extend the crop insurance deadline for seeding soybeans. So there's a lot of things, plus the summer that we had no summer. We had, I don't think we had a day that was anywhere above 25 degrees most of the summer. Um, they took a long time to get going, and we never did get anything uh, worthwhile that particular year. So um, we're going to go through the staging here in a minute, but I want to show you a couple of slides here. First of all, uh, this first slide here is from uh, the Morris uh, test location in 2011. And uh, two varieties in early season uh, 2310RY on September the 8th, and uh, NSC Portage on September the 8th. And um, the 2310s, they reached they're 95% brown pod, what we consider mature, on uh, that particular day, whereas Portage still had two days to go. So again, visually, this is what you're going to be seeing when you're out in the field when you're looking at a variety on the left that's 95% brown pod versus a variety here on the right that, you know, just quickly looking at it with more, uh, maybe maybe be 10% brown pod, but more uh, in that 60% uh, or 70% yellow pod. Um, looking at uh, the Carmen site in 2012 to give you a difference in one year to the next, uh, 2310 on September the 5th, 95% uh, brown pod, um, and uh, on September the 5th, NSE Portage is a lot further along. Keep in mind the differences between the two years is that in 2011 we had a lot more moisture. It does extend maturity to some degree, and uh, last year in the Carmen site it was quite a bit drier. So. Um, typically the beans do mature on a, a little quicker on a drier year. So just to give you a comparison. And the next slide here, this is uh, the reason why we are so critical on, on varieties and growing one that's suited for your growing region. On uh, this, the variety NSE Portage and Morris in 2011 reached 95% brown pot, brown pot 
where the variety on the right, uh, a longer season, which is five days longer on uh, that particular day, uh, was still not mature yet, still not hit 95% brown pod. You can actually even see in the slide a few uh, um, you know, yellow pods and even some green pods in there as well. But we had a frost that morning. So now frost at this stage typically won't affect the yield, but it will affect the quality. And you may have more green seed issues in it to that effect. A um, couple slides, I'm not going to seal all of Mike's thunder, but I did ask him for a few slides here that I could put in, into my presentation just to kind of show you where we're at. And uh, this is the corn heat accumulation from May 15th to August 11th. And uh, just to show you a comparison here, the Altona, the, in the Altona to Emerson area, uh, ranging from 1801 to 1851 uh, corn heat units. Uh, the Swan River here area, 1500 to and 51 to 1600 corn heat units, and uh, Boys of Maine 1651 uh, to 1700. How does that compare to normal? Uh, this next slide here is a percent normal for those areas. Um, Altona to Latalia are kind of bouncing in that 98 to 102 percent of normal, so a little less than uh, our uh, long-term average. Uh, Swan River area 96 to 98 percent of our uh, uh, total corn heat unit accumulation and uh, boys of Maine, uh, 94 to uh, uh, up to 98 percent. So still a little cooler than what, we were, than what our norms are. Um, the next slide here I wanted to throw in here because this year it had, does have some similarities to 2011. Uh, in 2011, uh, the spring, we did have uh, uh, a bit of a delayed uh, start in spring. It was pretty wet. And uh, so I did a comparison for uh, this year to 2011 and looked at the corn heat units for those areas. And as you can see on the right here, uh, the Altona Latelier area in 2011, uh, upwards of uh, 1,900 uh, corn heat units. And uh, this year, 1,851 corn heat units. So we are a little bit behind 2011. And uh, 2011, we had a frost on September 14th, but typically all the beans made it and there was no major quality issues, although there were some green seed issues from, from, uh, from grower to grower, but uh, no major issues. Uh, Swan River area, very similar. Uh, again, a little bit uh, warmer in 2011 compared to this year. And uh, Boys of Maine, same idea with the uh, being very close in Corn Heat units to 2011. So uh, we still have lots of time left in, in August yet. And with the hot weather that we're uh, projecting uh, going into the weekend here, that should really move things along with the beans. Okay. Um, again, this is just another slide, just uh, showing you the uh, uh, percent normal of in those areas over the uh, over the two years. And uh, in 2011, we were a bit above uh, the uh, uh, corn heat units for the same time period, 104 uh, percent of normal. And uh, and this year we're just a little, a little bit cooler. So, okay. And just to show you what the numbers were here last year, um, this is the uh, for the entire season last year from May 15th to September 15th. Um, so a lot of these areas we were quite a bit warmer last year, uh, upwards of, uh, you know, in some areas in the, uh, in the, in the green areas, 105% of, uh, of normal in that uh, um, Altona area and uh, a lot of the other areas too were, were still quite a bit above normal last year. And that's kind of why I compared to 2011, just because it, it was a little bit cooler. So. Uh, looking at the stages, now we're going to start at the R1 stage and the beans are going to be well past this as well, but I just kind of wanted to start at this point just to go through the, the various stages of, of reproductive growth in soybeans. Uh, the R1 stage, typically um, when you're at the R1 stage, it's where you find your first flower at any node on the plant and usually that's mid to late July. Uh, moving into the R2 stage, um, this is where you want to start looking at the top of the plant to judge maturity. Uh, R2 stage, your first flower is uh, showing up one of the two top nodes of the plant. Of the plant. Uh, that's when you're in R2. Um, R3 stage, typically you want to look at the four uppermost nodes of the plant, and that's when you're going to see your first pod showing up at the uh, at the first one of the one on one pod on the first um, uh, upper foremost nodes. Okay. Um, when you're getting into the R4 stage. Typically, you're looking at, again, still looking at the main, uh, main stem and you're looking at the top four nodes and that's where you want to see at least one pod that's three quarters of an inch long on that uh, upper foremost nodes. 
now we're getting to the stage where a lot of the soybeans are at right now at the uh, R5 stage. And uh, R5 stage um, is where you have seed that is uh, an eighth of an inch long in the pod at one of the four uppermost nodes in the main stem. So that's typically where a lot of the soybeans are right now. Uh, interesting few things to note at this stage, when you're uh, partway through the R5 to R6 stage, uh, that's where you're going to reach your maximum height, also the maximum node area and the maximum leaf area in those areas. Uh, in that stage as well, if you were to have 100% leaf loss, that's when you're going to see a, quite a dramatic loss in yield and up to 75% at that stage. Uh, next that we're going to be getting to fairly soon here is uh, we're going to be hitting into our sixth stage and that's where you're going to see full C. And I also threw a slide in here on the bottom here to show you the, uh, the R5 stage, but to show you this pod cavity. So in uh, the R6 stage is where that seed is filled that entire cavity and the cavity is this whitish area around the seed. Um, now uh, moving on, we're going to, we're going to start to see some uh, some yellowing after R6 and, and that continues right up through to R8 stage. And that's what's uh, considered as physiological maturity, 95% brown pot. Okay. R7 stage, uh, we're still a little ways away from that, but once we get to that, that's when you're going to see at least one normal pot on the main stem um, that has reached its mature brown color. So here's a plant uh, that has reached the R7 stage. And finally, we're going to see uh, when the plant is physiologically mature, um, that is 95% brown pod, and uh, that's the ratings that you'll see in seed Manitoba uh, of the various varieties from day of planting to 95% brown pod. What that also means is that from uh, that day of 95% brown pod, you're 7 to 10 days away from harvest. Um, this next slide here will, will show you some of the uh, rough time periods between the different stages. Um, if you go down to the R5 to R6 stage, um, on average you're looking at about 15 days, but it can vary from 11 to 20 days. Um, from the R6 to R7 days, uh, on average it's about 18 days. Uh, again, it varies from 9 to 30 days depending on, on the growing season. And um, also yeah, from R7 to R8, uh, that's an average of 9 days and a range of 7 to 18 days. So if you were to look at R5 to R7, uh, you are probably be looking roughly at about 33 days, maybe a little earlier. Um, that, once you get to R7, that will, uh, uh, you won't see any yield loss um, or very little yield loss at that stage if you do get a frost. So that's kind of what we're, I think, what we're shooting for right now to get to that stage. Um, here are some numbers that, uh, you know, that I'd like to throw up there as well. Um, yield reductions from late season frost injury are, are typically smaller as a crop matures. So for us during the R5 stage, which is where we're, at, where we're at right now, you'll see a yield loss between 50 to 70 percent. Um, once you get into R6, um, and you have a killing frost at that time, you'll see a yield loss of, of 20 to 30 percent. Um, once you hit R7, though, then you're only looking at a 5 percent yield loss. So even though there might be some, there'll probably be some quality issues with green seed, uh, as far as yield loss, you won't see any yield loss there. And uh, typically no yield loss as the uh, as the plants uh, reach full maturity. So, so that's uh, some of the summaries of, of growth stages of where we're at right now. Again, just to reiterate, we are at the R5 stage and we're still a little ways away from harvest yet, but they are calling for some good warm weather uh, up and coming here in the next week or so, and that should really bring things uh, along. So, and um, do you have any questions at all? Yes, I do, uh, Dennis. Um, the question here is, could you please tell the difference between the yield in 2011 and 2013 compared to the heat percentage of the de of that two years? Well, in, in uh, 2011 and 2013, I guess the yield in 2011 um, was uh, 27 bushels an acre. That was a provincial average. Now, even though we finished off the last two weeks of, uh, of uh, July, Oh, sorry, the last two weeks of August in 2011 were very hot and dry. And um, also the first week of September very hot and dry. And it did, it did uh, move things along uh, nicely. The yield going into 2012 was quite a bit higher, uh, 36 bushels an acre. So 
you know, overall, uh, our big, biggest yield loss that we that we occurred in 2011 was just due to the lack of moisture in July and August. A lot of the plants kind of shut down early. So this year we've had a lot more moisture. So, um, you know, as long as we get the heat uh, coming in, we should be okay as far as yield goes going into 2013. But uh, until, we, uh, until we get the harvest, we won't know what our yield's going to be. Thank you. Lionel, did you have any questions for Dennis? Yeah, just uh, one minute. If you could just uh, quickly get me show my screen. I got a picture here for you, Dennis. I uh -oh. wanted, to, wanted to show you just to... Uh, um, I was out in the field here the other day, and this is what I was seeing a lot of. Uh, this was pictures taken probably uh, Friday of last week. Uh, so this is the upper part of the plant. So these are the type of pods we're seeing. So with that, are you thinking 35 days yet before we're? Well, with 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 that, and that's the uppermost pod. And do you have do you have seeds in those pods? Oh, there was there was seeds starting to form in in these type ones, but in these ones here, there wasn't. Yeah, no, in these ones here. Uh, once you start in that uppermost pause, once you start getting, you know, that you know eighth of an or that eighth of an inch seed showing up, then then you're at R5. If you're not, if you only have pods that are three quarter of an inch, then you're at R4. Then you're a little longer yet. So, so it's we're you know we're in that R well R5 maybe R4.5 somewhere in there right now. So uh, we're still going to need a lot of cooperation from Mother Nature to get to, to get things finished off this year yet. Okay. Uh, good. Well, um, uh, any more questions for Dennis, Linda? No, that's all I have right now. Okay. Well, thanks, Dennis. Uh, a lot of good information there. Uh, uh, Mike is uh, is on right now, so and he has to uh, be be leaving us shortly. So uh, uh, we're going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to give us a little bit of what we can expect for weather to get some of these crops to come in over the next thirty days or forty days. So. Take it away, Mike. Uh, thanks, Lionel. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me properly. Um, we were forecasting earlier in uh, the middle of June that we'd expect to see relatively normal conditions for July and August. Well, obviously, July was a bit uh, below normal in terms of temperature. We had about a two or three degree uh, below average. But as everybody knows right now, uh, there's warm air coming in. And by the looks of things, it's going to be around for at least eight, nine days until we get a, a bit of a cooling trend. So uh, things are looking up to, to start getting those 20 degree day days. So I'm going to whip through quickly through some of the slides and some of the summations that we've seen so far this season. And we'll take a look at the forecast long term and short term and near term. So here we go. Uh, the first chart that you're looking at is uh, the, the seven day accumulated rainfall for the last seven days. Um, from Monday to uh, last Sunday. Um, as you can see, not too much in some areas, nothing more than an inch uh, uh, in the sprague area. Um, taking a look at the whole prairies, this is the percent of average precip, and this goes back from April 1st all the way to August 12th. And as you can see, the southern prairies pretty well completely are well above normal. Um, there's not too many areas in, in the prairies that are below normal except uh, north of that Melville area and our central interlake and some of the um, northeast uh, stations also. Here's the accumulated rainfall from May 1st to August 11th, and it's the percentage of normal. And as you can see, the rest and area is still being impacted, at least in the amounts, by those early season uh, severe weather. Um, this map ranges all the way from 70% all the way up to 225%. Uh, the blue areas are basically 175 to 225% normal. So that southwest is still seeing the, the impact from the earlier season rains. Um, to take a look at this, there's not too many areas this year compared to last year that are well below 100%. Obviously, the eastern portions are pushing right around 75 to 100, but it's a bit, we got a, lip, a lot more convective rain this year as opposed to last year, when last year was uh, the taps were turned off in July. So. A lot different July this year uh, compared to last year. 
here's the numbers in terms of the accumulated amounts for May 1st to August 11th. And they range all the way from 150 millimeters all the way to 471. Um, you can see that Suris area, the Reston area, all of Pearson, um, huge amounts. That's just a bit above the whole season all the way to the end of September. So they've already received their whole season rainfall. Um, just to note that the, uh, uh, the dry areas, uh, again, this year seem to be east of the Red River Valley. Um, just to take a peek at July and what the impact was, obviously, um, we didn't receive the GDD. We usually do. Um, here's a map from Ag Canada that shows the monthly mean temperature difference from normal um, for the month of July. And the gray areas are, are between uh, one degree and two degrees below normal. So you can see that this is widespread um, throughout the prairies, this cooling trend. But if you recall, in June we said a normal um, July and August and temper. Um, that was only three, four weeks of uh, July, and we could rebound easily. So um, normal's normal. Uh, here is the percentage of normal growing degree days, and we can really see the impact of that cooler in July here, where you, usually at this time of the year that uh, we've got a lot of 110% of normals. On the map in this year, the maximum is just 102% of normal. Um, obviously, with this 30 degree weather coming in, we're going to start to rebound to see those 20, 21 uh, growing degree days that will really uh, help out the totals here and hopefully make the season turn out fine. Um, some of the lower areas, obviously, the higher elevation. But what's interesting to see is just west of the, the southern Red River Valley, it's nice and lower. There's a few stations that are below 100%, which I haven't seen in two or three years in terms of heating. So uh, moving into almost the middle of August, but yeah, I haven't seen that in a few years for sure. Um, here's the numbers of growing degree days uh, for the tally um, from May 1st to August 11th. And yeah, we're down. Uh, or the max that you'll see on there is 1217. Um, most of the areas are doing okay, but once again, that uh, the, the numbers just start. It, it doesn't look really like we're in the middle of August for some of those numbers. Those are the numbers we see in the latter part of uh, July. So um, we move quickly to corn heat units, and this is the percentage of normal. Um, we need about 2,500 uh, CHUs to get a, a crop off. And this one runs from May 1st to August 11th, and it's the percentage of normal. And we do got some 110s, but these are mostly uh, in the western region. Um, the familiar Red River, Southern Red River Valley 110s just aren't visible this year. And you can see the higher elevation up around the, the Pilot Mound, Manitou area. It's kind of a bit more widespread than it usually is. Usually it's isolated just to those hills, but this year it's a bit spread out. Um, here's the accumulated corn heat units for May 1st to August 11th. And you can see that right around 1900, we're almost breaking, probably broke the uh, 2000 in the next couple of days for corn heat units. So um, they range from 1400 all the way to 1900. And taking a look down south, uh, the conditions down there, we've been watching that for a couple of years. The dry conditions have kind of persisted for a while down there. Um, this is the actual analysis from August 6th. And, you know, most of the trouble areas in northern North Dakota are totally off the map now, as forecasted a couple months ago. Um, there's a bit of alleviation, but some of those locations are still hurt. And this is, you know, year three. So ha that's how things look. The Midwest is a, is a lot brighter than it was last year at this time, for sure. So they should not be in the same situation they were last year. Um, here's the outlook, and this is valid. Um, from now all the way to the end of October, and it was released July 18th. Um, you can see that there's nothing in the, the upper plains to show or indicate that there's going to be any kind of drying. So I think the um, no indication of anything but normal forecast is kind of panning out so far, especially with this warm from air coming. Um, there's lots of improvement in West Texas and a few of those states that have really been hit up. So. It's not progressing and alleviating as fast as they forecasted, but it's still uh, not as bad as it could be. So there is some improvement throughout the south. Um, we'll move on to the long-range forecast. Um, this is the Environment Canada issue for forecast of probability of temperature above, below, or near. And taking a look at this chart, there's no indication of anything above or below, except uh, 
I guess southwestern uh, Saskatchewan has a bit of a, a below normal. Here's the American for the same period. This is uh, August, September, and October outlook for temperature probability. And uh, as you can see, there's no indication of anything but normal, which hopefully means that we've lost our cold spell for a bit. Um, here's Environment Canada probability of precip for August, September, and October. And the good thing is, is it doesn't look like there's, a, uh, there's below or above normal for us in southern Manitoba, although west of us is a different story. Um, here's the precip probability for August, September, and October, and there's no indications of anything but normal for precip. So August is usually our usually the month where things mellowed out, and uh, hopefully it happens this year. Um, I'll get to the mid-range models here. These are the Canadian um, global models, and this one is for accumulated precip from this morning all the way out till Friday night next week. Um, there's a small little low in north and uh, northeastern Montana right now that is going to give you guys in the southwest uh, a risk of a thunderstorm for the next couple of days, but after that, high pressure is definitely going to sink in, and it'll just be that hot air mass with uh, the chance for showers. So although we look at this map right here and see the green is is up to 15 millimeters, and some even less in just around the Winnipeg region, when we get up to 30, 32 degrees and dew points in the mid-20s, then the possibility for some good thunderstorms is there, so I don't really see that in terms of the forecast that they've issued today, but that chance is always there. So to see that yellow blob, which is about 40, uh, in the south, uh, western portion of Manitoba, uh, right around here, uh, those are due to the next couple of days of that instability as that low moves out of uh, Montana. So it should be all dissipated by the time it gets uh, eastward to the central region, but Southwest looks like uh, some thunder boomers here and there. Not too much accumulation, but some of these thunderstorms can give up to 50 millimeters. So, um, here's the American for the same time range. Um, the green is about a quarter an inch, so it, it basically jives with uh, the Canadian model, except they don't really have um, the amounts for the next couple of days in the southwest there. So, um, this also brings us out to next Friday. So. Um, here's a bit longer. This one takes us almost to the end of the month. It's the American model. It goes a bit farther. And there's nothing really significant there. That's a half inch, three quarters of an inch for the, that two-week period. So um, things are looking up in terms of uh, some of those areas that don't want any more rain because it doesn't look like it's going to really uh, be a big widespread event the next two weeks. Where are we? Okay. I'm going to quickly touch on uh, the risk of frost. There was some talk uh, around uh, that yesterday we there saw some, maybe possibly some evidence of frost. I didn't see it on any of the uh, minimum temperatures for yesterday. Um, however, some stations did get to uh, down to about plus two. So this chart here is the date of first fall frost, and it's a 25% risk map, which means one in every four years. Um, there's a good luck, likelihood of these dates will be true for the regions. And you can see that most of the central regions are into the first or second week of September, and the northwest is more like the end of August, start of September. So um, those dates are approaching. This is a one in four year risk of fall frost. Um, here's the date of first fall frost, 50% risk. So this means one in every two years you should expect those dates. Um, for the first frost. And you can see the southern Red River valleys up into the middle to the latter portion of September and uh, the northwest is uh, first week, week and a half of September. So there's the risk maps uh, for frost. Uh, it's coming shortly. Well, shortly in a month in our time is kind of quick. Um, here's where all the stations are where we uh, use to make our maps up. Uh, they're a combination of our program and Environment Canada. So we're starting to get some good coverage around. We still have some holes, but it's looking pretty good. Um, that's all I have unless anybody has any questions. Okay, uh, Mike, 
Uh, Linda, did you, am I on right now? Yes, you are, Lionel. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Mike, uh, that was uh, good information. Uh, you were talking about the wet conditions in the, in the west here, and uh, I was uh, out there yesterday in the Reston, Pipestone area, and talking to a couple of farmers, and first time I heard about duels being put on swathers because it's so wet out there still. So we definitely don't need uh, even the half inch of rain that you're talking about. So, so uh, but uh, that was good information and hopefully the, the frost holds off. I think that's the big concern with a lot of the soybean and the, uh, and the uh, corn acres out here. Um, with, uh, with that, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll jump over to Pam now and uh, we'll talk about the corn and the corn situation and see what she's got to give us an update as to what staging and assessing our staging in corn for this time of year. I'm on. Yes, you are, Pam. Go ahead whenever uh, you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to Lionel for inviting me to speak at this morning's webinar. Um, we're just going to go, um, he tried to give me 10, 10 minutes, he said, so I'll try to be accommodating. Um, so we're just going to go over uh, grain corn maturity in uh, 2013. Where's the, there we go. Um, so just a quick review of what I'll quickly cover today. Um, just crop development and corn heat accumulation in 2013, and uh, Mike Robuski's already showed you some maps. Um, reproductive stages and kernel development of corn. And of course, this is going to be important as we start moving forward towards maturity and uh, recognizing the stages of plant growth. Um, of course, I'll probably hopefully give, take a give a give a take home message, and hopefully we'll have some time for some uh, Q and A afterwards. Uh, so basically, uh, Mike was already showing you guys in terms of corn heat accumulation, and uh, basically up until the silking stage of development, um, uh, corn development is closely tied to that corn heat accumulation. And here is the corn heat accumulation. It's a fancy equation. Um, it's shown at the top of your screen there. So basically, it's taking you know the maximum temperature. Do I say change the color scheme? Is that what I accept there, Linda? Uh, no, just uh, the bottom one. Oh, oh. It'll, it's okay. It'll come back up, Pam. And when it does, okay. just do the bottom, the, one. Uh, bottom one. So yeah. Okay, perfect. Because I'm sure it'll pop up again. Um, so anyways, um, so basically you're taking, you're looking at a, the maximum temperature over the day, minimum temperature, and basically dividing by, dividing by two. Um, so of course everyone's probably realized that over the growing season so far, we haven't really had, um, especially over the past probably three weeks to a month, we've had some really cool temperatures, uh, both in the daytime and over the nighttime. So for example, I've given here, you know, a daily maximum temperature of 22 degrees, um, a daily minimum temperature of 10 degrees, and that's over the nighttime. And in some cases, that may be being generous. So we're only seeing, you know, heat accumulations uh, per day of about 19, where, you know, normally in July, um, you know, it's not unusual to see um, daily maximum temperatures, you know, approaching the 30. And then, you know, nighttime temperatures not even going below 20, where, you know, we'll have corn heat accumulation, you know, in those, you know, 30 per day categories. So, you can definitely see kind of the impact that um, the cooler temperatures definitely have had on uh, corn development. And of course, uh, you've seen that out in the field as well, where these cool cool temperatures and rainy conditions um, have definitely uh, slowed it down out there, where after that uh, July first time frame where we were having those really hot temperatures, where you can almost, where you could probably literally hear the corn growing out in the field uh, during those days. Um, so. Basically, you know, after silking, though, so up to silking, you know, corn development is closely tied to um, corn heat accumulation. Um, but once you've reached that silking stage, um, actually the number of calendar days has more an effect on crop development as opposed to corn heat accumulation. And uh, for the most part, you know, once that silking stage has been reached, um, it basically marks that time frame where you're we're looking at 55 to 60 days to um, physiological maturity of that green crop. And of course, there's always a range provided because it'll depend a lot on still on the temperatures and the growing conditions that you get, but as well as um, the maturity, um, the corn heat unit rating of the hybrid that you're dealing with as well. So if we go, so the R1 stage was that silking stage, and most of the crop in Manitoba is at that stage um, at this point. Uh, the next stage that we'll be entering into is the R2 or the blister stage. 
And this occurs about 10 to 14 days after silking. So for some crops, I've heard in the eastern uh, part of the province that it's already, some of the corn is already into that blister stage of development. And uh, this marks, you know, about 45 to 50 days to maturity. Um, so basically the kernel, um, hence the blister stage, kind of resembles a blister. And the kernel moisture content is about 85 to 90 percent. Uh, the next stage that the corn will hit is the milk stage, or what we call the R3. Um, this occurs about 18 to 22 days after silking. And of course, then this marks about 35 to 40 days to maturity. Um, at this point, that kernel is yellow colored uh, with the inside containing that milky white fluid, which is you know the milk stage. Uh, kernel moisture is dropped, and it's about 70 to 80 percent. And this is the stage where starch is beginning to accumulate within that kernel. Uh, the R4 stage is the dough stage. Uh, occurs approximately 24 to 28 days after silking, and this marks 30 to 35 days to that physiological maturity. Um, interior of kernel has thickened to a dough or uh, paste-like substance, and the kernel moisture is about 60 to 70 percent. And the kernels may actually begin to dent, you know, at the base of the ear. So when you're staging basically from that R2 to R4 stage, um, uh, basically if you're looking at the uppermost cob on the plant, and in some cases this year we've seen that some plants are producing two cobs, but in terms of staging the crop, you want to look at the top cob. And for that R2 to R4 um, stages, um, basically the, cro the crop has hit that stage when, you know, kind of the middle kernels of, on that top cob has uh, kind of reached these um, milestones in terms of, for the dough stage, the interior of the kernel has thickened to that dough or paste-like substance. Um, as we enter into the R5 uh, dense stage, uh, this is where you want the entire cob to be um, exhibiting these symptoms where the kernels are dented at the top of the, so that milk line, uh, separating the milk or the liquid and the solid, which is the starch portions of the kernel. So, at the R5 and onward, you want the whole cob to be um, at this stage in order for it to be considered at the dense stage. So once again, the dense stage, it's about 35 to 42 days after uh, silking. And uh, so once again, this marks still about 27 to 32 days to maturity. And at this stage, the kernel moisture content is about 50 to 55%. Um, continuing on with the dense stage, it's during this, with, during this stage, that the kernels are often staged according to the progression of that milk line. So for example, um, at half milk line, uh, moisture content of kernels is about 35 to 40 percent. And at the half, half milk line stage, um, within that dense stage, um, days to maturity is about 13 to 18 days. And this is often where you hear um, guys talking if they're wanting to take a crop off for silage in terms of staging a crop, in terms of where the milk line is for optimum harvest timing. And of course, R6 is where we want to reach, and that's basically physiological maturity. Uh, once again, we've come back full circle where this is about 55 to 65 days after silking, um, or 55 to 60 days. Um, so this is basically reached when the milk line has, has disappeared, and that starch has basically reached the base of the kernel. And this is where um, we'll often see that black layer formation. And it often is that kind of that uh, visual cue um, when the plant is actually um, is, has reached maturity. Um, kernel moisture is about 30 to 35 percent, um, but this can vary uh, between hybrid and the environment as well. Of course, now we've gone through all the stages. Of course, now the big question is, or maybe the bigger question is, you know, when will frost occur? And I know Mike just threw up this map as well. So um, obviously, when we're looking at kind of the stage of the crop is at now, knowing how many days it takes it to reach um, physiological maturity. Um, I think we realize that we'll probably need some really good, some really nice weather, um, things to dry down, and then uh, an open fall to uh, get that crop to, um, to reach uh, physiological matur maturity or as close to as possible before that first fall frost. And uh, basically, probably this is the table that sums it up the best. Um, in terms of you have your growth stage ranging from silking to uh, black layer, which is actually that physiological maturity. Um, your calendar days, which we've already gone through, the moisture content as well. And of course, we'll see here kind of the associated uh, yield loss um, at each of the various stages. If we have um, basically a frost, a killing frost event um, at any one of these stages. So, as with any crop type, the closer you get to uh, physiological maturity, the less effect 
um, that's going to have on yield loss. Um, so if you get down to that half milk line stage, um, you can maybe only see a 5 to 10 percent yield loss, you know, a little bit of a hit to your test weight, um, but we definitely want to get to that, um, that black layer um, stage. And I think that's a typo for the test weight there. That's the rock and test weight there. Uh, so basically, um, take-home message is uh, corn development uh, definitely has been slowed by those uh, moderate temperatures that we have been seeing. Um, but these temperatures that are being forecasted will definitely help the crop um, advance to maturity. Um, I think I already mentioned this, but we'll probably will need an open fall for the crop to reach that physiological uh, maturity in order to have you know, minimal impact on yield and quality um, of the crop. Um, Another thing to mention is after it's hit physiological maturity, um, the kernel moisture content is still at that 30 to 35 percent moisture. So it still needs to dry down significantly um, for producers to be able to harvest that crop, um, dry it, and store it safely. Um, and of course, um, as we delay that process further into the fall, um, it can have an impact on kernel dry down because you don't often get those nice hot temperatures that does hasten um, kernel dry down. Um, that we do see if a crop does mature earlier in the season. So, um, of course, this all will depend on the weather conditions that we do get from now on, but um, this is probably something to definitely uh, keep in mind as well. And uh, maybe if the honeymoon is over in terms of producers being able to, you know, take their crop off, either dry or just aerate it, um, we'll probably be looking at producers, you know, having to, you know, artificially dry down their corn this year uh, to save storage moisture content. Um, that's all I have. Um, I have some reference websites where I've pulled up that a lot of the information on the growth stages. Um, that nice table that you've seen um, in terms of summarizing all the growth stages and effect on yields and that type of thing was actually from North Dakota State University's uh, the Crop and Pest um, uh, publication. So that was a really good uh, source to use. And uh, of course, I'll PDF this and uh, send it to Lionel so in case anybody wants it for reference. Um, we can uh, definitely do that. So hopefully there's some time for questions. Uh, yeah, actually, Linda, is there any questions? I don't have any questions for Pam right now. Could you uh, go to show my screen? I just wanted to, I was out in the field too of corn and I got some pictures and I was just wanting to show one to Pam here. Uh, Pam, the, that picture there, that's kind of the stage uh, last Wednesday, Thursday that a lot of the corn was uh, in the uh, southwest here. Um, oh, okay. So th that's not quite the blister one, right? Not quite yet, no. Okay, so timing for that crop, then this is good. This is grain corn. This was, it wasn't going to be for silage, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're probably looking towards, you know, End of the, well, it depends on the growing. I mean, I would like I said before, like um, after silking, it you know it's more dependent upon calendar days. But having said that, it also does still depend on um, the weather conditions that we get to. So obviously, hotter, drier weather will definitely help advance the crops and hopefully put it on the shorter end of all those uh, time ranges that um, I presented uh, in the uh, in the presentation. And as well, I'm assuming he's probably selected a you know a lower heat unit variety. Um, which of course we'll still put on the lower end as well. So, um, but we're probably still looking, you know, end of September type of thing. So, okay, good. Well, um, thanks, Pam. That was uh, again a lot of good information and a really good chart there. I think that if anybody wants it, we'll be able to get it to them. And uh, it'll, once again, it's uh, the site, uh, the webinar is recorded, so we'll have that information available. Okay. So, thanks Perfect. again, Pam. Thank you, Lionel. Uh, next, uh, Linda, we'll go to John, and John's going to give us an update on the armyworm situation and some of the other bugs that uh, we're seeing out there. Uh, we're getting some spraying going on in the southwest here, so uh, take it away, John. Okay, well, thanks, Lionel. Uh, yeah, what I'm going to go over is uh, Bertha armyworm. Um, my intention was to focus on uh, when is spraying needed, uh, timing, if you do need to spray, what is a good timing, and I'll cover a little bit about products as well, and we'll touch very briefly on ligus bugs and grasshoppers as well. So, uh, to start in, uh, you 
probably saw some of these green traps up around the province earlier in the year. Uh, these are pheromone baited traps that we use to collect the adult moths and basically forecast where hot spots will be. And oddly enough, a lot of our hot spots were projected in more the east and central region. Uh, some of the traps in around Elm Creek, Sperling, uh, Ridgevale's near Dominion City, those were higher counts. Uh, Roblin area, there was a pocket of higher trap counts. There weren't any really high. John, I muted you. Um, all you need to do is click on keep the current setting and that will disappear. Bottom one. There you go. Great, thank you. So uh, there weren't a lot of high trap counts in the southwest, but we certainly do know there's some higher larva populations in some fields, not all of them. Now, to scout for Bertha armyworm, uh, the way I like to do it is, first of all, uh, you want to, I don't really recommend scouting a full meter square because it's a lot of uh, area to be uh, examining on the ground. What I usually do is carry my, this orange thing you see in the picture on the left is a three-sided frame that's 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, so it's a quarter meter square. And the first thing I would do is mark out the area to be examined, uh, give the plants a good shake within that quarter meter square. Normally, most of the larva will already be on the ground during the day. But just in case, if you're on the plants, give the plants a good shake. And then basically just start searching on the ground. Look under any debris, any plant material, any clods of soil. They like to hide during the day. So you do need to examine quite carefully in that quarter meter square. Uh, don't spend any more than five to 10 minutes. Probably five minutes per uh, site that you check is good. And ideally aim for about 10 sites. Uh, five minimum is what you should do. Uh, populations can vary within a field, so uh, do check at, at least five sites just to see what your average population is. And be careful of going on kind of um, knee-jerk or gut reactions because you find a few of them. A uh, few army, birth of army worms isn't going to be economical to treat. Uh, you want to make sure you're uh, very minimum in that 10 to 15 larva per meter square range for it to be economical to be treating a field. Uh, the larva, when you're scouting, do realize they can be one of three color phases. They can be green, brown, or black. These are all birth of armyworm larvae of roughly the similar stage, so it's not just a staging thing where they change colors. As fully mature larvae, they can be one of three colors. So that's just something else you have to keep in mind when you're doing the scouting. All of these are birth of armyworm larvae. So uh, economic threshold, how many is too many? Uh, the, I guess, the long answer is it depends on the value of your canola and the cost of your control. And we have developed charts to help you with this. I don't have it up on my screen, but uh, on our website, on our Bertha Armyworm fact sheet, there is a chart where you can factor in the cost of your canola, what you expect to receive, and the anticipated control cost. Uh, the values in that chart will range anywhere from about 10 to 34 per meter square. But as I mentioned, probably somewhere in that 10 to 15 per meter square range is uh, realistic for this year. Uh, so again, I do, I do look, uh, and you, you can use that chart again to fine tune it for your field. Uh, the way those thresholds were determined, uh, quite a bit of research was done on birth to army worm few decades ago, and they found that on average the loss was about 0 0.058 bushels per acre for, for each larva per meter square. So that's the number we use to determine that economic threshold. And it is a fairly well-researched threshold, not a nominal one like diamondback moth or quite a few of the ones that we use. Okay, so if you're above the economic threshold, when is the best time if you want to uh, try a time of spray? Uh, realize that late in the game, the, the leaf loss because of birth of armyworm will cause very little yield loss. So the, 
the birth of armyworms can feed on the leaves and really not being be doing a lot of damage to your yield. What they eventually may start doing is feeding on pods, and that's what can be economical. So if you're above that economic threshold, the ideal spray timing would be just as larvae are starting to feed on the pods. Don't let that pod feeding go too far. Uh, if you know you're well above economic threshold and you're fairly confident the hatch is done and you're kind of getting out of that flowering period, you could spray as soon as possible. Uh, but if there's a lot of very young larvae still, you want to make sure the hatch is done. And that's one of the reasons we caution people, don't be in too much of a hurry, uh, especially if they're not doing any pod feeding. Make sure the hatch is done so you're only doing one spray. Okay, now regarding insecticides, the other uh, problem we run into late in the season is pre-harvest intervals. And a pre-harvest interval is the time between your last spray and swathing, not when you're combining the crop, when you're swathing. So that's pre-harvest interval. And you, you really do want to take these seriously. I know the Canola Council of Canada has a quite a big campaign to try to make sure people know what these are and are respecting them. Uh, because there have been incidents where basically whole shiploads of grain uh, in, and canola as well were sent back because trace residue was found by one of the uh, countries, countries purchasing. So I, I know they're very nervous about uh, making sure people respect these pre-harvest intervals. Once you get uh, into the period where you've got roughly a week until you anticipate swathing, Really, you're down to some of your pyrethroids like desis, matador, and corrigin as your options. And once you're under a week until swathing, corrigin really is your only option. Uh, corrigin is a newer product. It's really the first year that that's on the market for a birth of armyworm. Uh, and it, it has a much shorter pre-harvest interval than uh, some of the other products. Uh, the other thing that's uh, nice about this product, too, is if there is any flowering in the crop when you're flowering, it is uh, easier on bees than a lot of the other products as well. But certainly, if you're within a couple weeks of anticipated swathing time, uh, don't be using any of the products in this lower end of the table. That could get you into trouble, or at least delay when you can swath your crop. Uh, a couple questions people have had about what drives these cycles, why do they pop up, and why do they disappear. Uh, natural enemies play a big part in regulating birth of armyworm cycles. And there's really four things that are involved. There's a, a, an orange wasp uh, called Bancus flavescens that lays eggs into the early instar larva. And when there's a lot of these little orange wasps around, they can really help take the population down. There's a hairy fly called tachinid fly that lays eggs into the later instar larva. If you have both the hairy fly and the orange wasp around, that'll really help. And last year, some of you may have noticed a lot of larvae dying on the top of the canopy. If they look like they're kind of melting into the canopy, it'll be a virus that's affecting them. If they look like they're turning kind of a chalky color, it'll be a fungus that's affecting them. So those are a few of the things that can help. So here's the orange wasp I was talking about, laying an egg into a young larva. And uh, on the picture on the right, you can see the wasp larva coming out of the back of a Bertha armyworm. So uh, that can really help. And if when you're scouting, by chance, you see any Bertha armyworms with a hole in the back, kind of right in behind the head, you would see a hole and a white patch around it. That means they've got the larva of one of these hairy flies living inside them. They're parasitized, they won't be feeding as much, and uh, they'll eventually die from the parasite that's inside them. So if you start seeing a lot of this when you're scouting, that's a good thing. Your population will be in trouble eventually. So hopefully I didn't cover that too quick, the birth of armyworm part. Uh, just a few notes about grasshoppers. I won't go on about this too much, because uh, uh, I know we've talked on these a bit already this year. Uh, Grass, the species that we've got most of this year seems to be two-striped grasshopper, the one where you can see two big stripes going down the back. The um, emergence this year was very staggered, uh, probably occurred over a good four or five weeks, so 
So right now we've got everything from about third or fourth instar nymphs to adults out there. They should be adults, mainly adults within a week or two. Um, the biggest question I guess I get is, will they feed on mature grain? Uh, the short answer is it's not their preferred food, but sometimes they will clip heads. Not always, sometimes. That's something you just want to keep an eye out for when you're doing your scouting. Uh, if there's lush green vegetation, they do prefer to feed on that rather than a drier crop. Uh, so once the crops start maturing, they will start looking for lusher vegetation, which is often your ditches, your roadside areas, which is why those areas get most of the eggs laid in them. Uh, so they will start moving out of the fields, but just make sure they're not doing too much feeding on uh, the heads of the crop and the grain. Uh, Ligus bugs, if you have a net, it's good to to sweep your canola and to see what the ligus bug situation is. If the crop is already getting quite mature, meaning the seeds in the lower pods are starting to harden already, you really don't need to worry about ligus at that point. If the lower pods still have seeds that are quite juicy and green and you can squish them easy, uh, it's still at a stage where ligus potentially could be a problem. Uh, really the only way you can look for them to make a, an informed decision on whether controls needed, it's use a sweep net. And I know with some of our taller, denser varieties, it is not easy going through as a sweep net, but unfortunately that's really the only way we can make uh, good informed decisions. So take the net, do a few sets of 10 sweeps, and see what you get. If you're getting any more than about, um, so when we get into the pod stage, we're looking at about 20 ligus bugs in 10 sweeps. As what would be considered a uh, concerning level. If you're just getting a few of them, that's normal, don't worry. If you're getting more than 20 and the lower pods are still quite young, uh, that's when there could be a concern. So far this year, Huligus bug hasn't been a, a big concern in canola. A uh, few fields, more in the eastern part of the province, uh, have had some higher levels. Aside from that, it hasn't been uh, that big of a deal. So maybe I'll end with that, and hopefully we've got time for a few questions. Okay, well, that was good, John. Uh, Linda, is there any questions? Yes, uh, I have one here. Um, is there a particular time of day that you should be scouting for Bertha armyworm? Will you get an accurate count if you scout in the heat of the day? Okay, uh, I guess I, you, you can scout any time of day and get an accurate count. Uh, now they are nocturnal, the larvae, so during the heat of the day they're going to be on the ground and trying to keep out of the heat. So during the day, kind of uh, do what I showed in um, that second or third slide. Uh, shake the plants but be looking on the ground. Don't be looking on the plants in the canopy during the day. But you can scout during the heat of the day. Just make sure you're focusing your, uh, your attention on the ground, and especially underneath any debris on the ground. That's where you're going to find them. Uh, they will come up onto the canopy later in the day and over the course of the evening. But trying to count them while they're in the canopy is not easy. It's probably just as easy or easier to count them during the day when they're on the ground. Uh, if it's a very heavy population and you're out there in the evening, it, it might be evident that, okay, we've got more than 10 or 15 per meter square. If it's a very heavy population, if it's borderline threshold, again, you're probably going to be in a situation where even later in the day you need to shake them down to the ground to count them. So I guess the short answer is you can scout any time of day as long as you are shaking the plants and counting thoroughly. Okay, John, uh, kind of continuing with that then, it'll be when would be the best time of day to spray for them? Uh, again, they're, they're nocturnal. So they hide in the day and come out at night. So the short answer is as late in the day as practical and convenient. Okay, good. Uh, well, thanks, John. Um, uh, if we have don't have any other questions, Linda. Um, I guess we're just about done for today. I've got a few quick slides to go over. And uh, 
will be done. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of the winter wheat crop that we've been following all year. You can see it's turning now and uh, if it's like a lot of the crops uh, that I've been in lately, uh, we probably would be able to find fusarium in it fairly easy this, this time of year. Uh, it's been showing up pretty much in every field. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I put this on because last week we didn't have the webinar, so this is the one chart from uh, July 29th, August 4th. There's been a lot of people that have been uh, kind of watching these, uh, these, these charts and, and trying to keep up with the numbers and see where we are. So here's the, uh, the numbers for this past week, and uh, it's been discussed enough today about, about our growing degree days and our percent of normal. So. Uh, we, uh, we definitely need the heat we're giving and, and hopefully because we planned the webinar talking about the late crop and what the weather conditions are, hopefully that brought on this warm weather that we're going to get for the next uh, five days here anyways and hopefully the rain stays away. And uh, just another slide, uh, Elmer sent me this one and uh, from some of the weather events we've been having, some of the wheat fields uh, haven't come back up and so there's going to be some issues. Uh, out in the fields with lodging for their, for this year, you definitely see a lot of fields in uh, in the southwest uh, showing that. And then one more thing, um, uh, this coming Thursday on uh, August the 15th, so that would be tomorrow uh, from 9.30 till noon, there's going to be a uh, McVet and Wado crop variety tour in the, uh, uh, I guess it's more in the kind of the Kenton, uh, uh, Hamiota area. and Everyone's welcome. We're going to be uh, going through uh, a few things. Uh, the cereal and western feed grains uh, site is there. So Scott Chambers will be there from uh, Wado, and he'll be going through that. Uh, John Gowlowski, who you just heard today, is going to be there, and he's going to be going through some of the insect issues that we uh, have been seeing in, in all crops. There's going to be everything from soybeans to flax to canola uh, to cereal crops there tomorrow. So uh, There'll be lots of good information there. Um, uh, Angela Brackenreed is going to be there from the Canola Council, and she's going to be going over uh, uh, the uh, some of the canola issues as well as uh, they did a good uh, presentation in uh, Carmen regarding canola harvest loss research. So she'll be going over there and going over that and giving us some good information. And then we also have Ken Gross there from uh, Ducks Unlimited, and uh, he'll be talking a little bit about uh, the winter wheat. Uh, for 2013. So uh, plan to have everybody out of there by uh, right around lunchtime or shortly after lunch. Lunch will be served. So uh, if uh, you're interested and want to pre-register, the number is there. If not, uh, the directions to the site are at the top of uh, the, the, the web page or the, the page here, or you could call this the service office or the uh, Amiota office uh, to get directions. Uh, like always, if you watch this as a recording, if you could just write a little bit of a note as to what we talked about today to get your CCA credits. And again, our contact information for the CIRS uh, office here and the contact information for the rest of the Southwest and South Parkland staff. So if you're wanting to find out directions for the meeting or just wanting to talk to somebody regarding some issues happening in your field, uh, give us a call. Uh, one more note uh, regarding the uh, birth armyworm. Uh, the hotspot areas in the southwest here are the Wawanisa, uh, uh, Killarney, across the Deloraine area, and then you get uh, west here uh, when I was out there, I guess just into Saskatchewan, the Carlisle area, I guess they're spraying, uh, spraying up in that area too. So, so if you're in those uh, uh, vicinities, it would definitely be a good, op good uh, thing to be watching uh, your crops. So with that, I think uh, we're done for uh, today, Linda, if there's no more questions. No, I don't have any more questions, Lionel. Okay, well good. Thanks for attending.